In this video, I want to talk with you about jealousy, but I want you to set aside all of the things that you kind of have learned in the world regarding jealousy, like the negative connotations. Because jealousy, despite the way that the world has distorted things or made people who are jealous, who feel jealousy to be, you know, create like a psychopath or something. <laughs> despite all that, we have a God who's jealous. We have a God who says that he jealously longs for us. So it's actually important that we understand jealousy. And we have a God who says that there's an idol that is going to provoke, that is going to incite his jealous wrath. So I want to talk with you about two things. We're going to talk about the abomination that incites his jealous wrath. And we're also going to talk about the offering for jealousy and how what he established there. So if a husband was feeling jealous and he felt that his wife had been unfaithful to him, he brought his wife to the priest and there was a whole ritual that kind of went on in order to determine whether she had actually been unfaithful. So we're going to go ahead and read about this in Numbers 5. Let's start in verse 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him so that another man has sexual relations with her and this is hidden from her husband and her impurity is undetected since there is no witness against her and she has not been caught in the act. And if feelings of jealousy come over her husband and he suspects his wife that she is impure, or if he is jealous and suspects her even though she is not impure. So both ways, by the way, don't go lean on your own interpretation and think, oh, this, you know, God must hate women. No, the man's going to be humiliated if he does this. And he, he has no reason. It's unwarranted. And he's just accusing his wife falsely. He's going to look like a fool. Then he is able to take his wife to the priest. He must also take an offering of a tenth of an ephah of barley flour on her behalf. He must not pour olive oil on it or put incense on it because it is a grain offering for jealousy, a reminder offering to draw attention to wrongdoing. Okay, so I just want to pause here and I want, to, I want us all to understand that God is our husband. Christ is our husband. The church is likened to his wife. And so that's the reason why God has established things this way. Okay, it's not like the husband is going to be unfaithful. Certainly human husbands can be unfaithful, but Christ himself is not going to be unfaithful to us. And so God can establish things however he wants. We don't get to judge God. We don't get to turn up and say, well, why didn't you make this equal? Or why didn't you blah, blah, blah. All of these social justice issues that the world creates, you know, to distract because they refuse to accept what God has actually established. And they're just a bunch of whiny people who want to say that everything that God established is wrong and it's not fair and it's not right and you owe me this and you owe me that. If we were living according to God as his people, we would be saying, we would be understanding this. We would be saying, you know what? It's not really about that. It's what God established. God established slavery because he wanted us to understand what it means to be a slave to him versus a slave to the devil. So he established slavery in which people were treated well and slavery in which people were not treated well. God does all these things. And before you want to go and say that, sure, it's easy for me to say that because I've never been a slave. First of all, it's unlikely that anyone listening to this video has been a slave at this time in history. Second of all, I have my own stuff. I'm a woman. I was born into a family in which there was quite a bit of mistreatment and oppression. But I'm not going to go there with all the things that are owed to me because what I'm pursuing are the things of God and what he established and that he's my vindicator. He's the one who's going to make these things right. And he's the one who knows what he's established in this world and in my personal life. These things that the world is doing are not helping humanity. They are not bringing unity to anybody. They establish division and chaos. We are supposed to trust in the justice that God has for us. Okay, so let's go back to this, but I just want to make sure that that's clear. Lean not on your own understanding. Seek what God is establishing here because he is just. Verse 16, the priest shall bring her and have her stand before the Lord. Then he shall take some holy water in a clay jar and put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. After the priest has had the woman stand before the Lord, he shall loosen her hair and place in her hands the reminder offering, the grain offering for jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water that brings a curse, okay? You want to remember the bitter water that brings a curse. I want you to keep remembering that because we've been talking about the third trumpet and you need to understand the bitter water that brings a curse. You also need to understand adultery and infidelity 
to a husband, if you're going to understand this trumpet. Then the priest shall put the woman under an oath, under oath and say to her, if no other man has had sexual relations with you and you've not gone astray and become impure while married to your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. But if you have gone astray while married to your husband and you have made yourself impure by having sexual relations, relations with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the woman under this curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. Then the woman is to say, amen, so be it. The priest is to write these curses on a scroll and then wash them off into the bitter water. He shall make the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse. And this water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering will enter her. The priest is to take from her hands the grain offering for jealousy, wave it before the Lord and bring it to the altar. The priest is then to take a handful of the grain offering as a memorial offering and burn it on the altar. After that, he is to give the woman, he is to have the woman drink the water. If she has made herself impure and been unfaithful to her husband, this will be the result. When she is made to drink the water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering, it will enter her, her abdomen will swell and her womb will miscarry and she will become a curse. Now think about that one. I want you to hold on to that because there's something that God's bringing to mind for me right now. If, however, the woman has not made herself impure but is clean, she will be cleared of guilt and she will be able to have children. This then is the law of jealousy when a woman goes astray and makes herself impure while married to her husband. Or when feelings of jealousy come over a man because he, is, he suspects his wife, the priest is to have her stand before the Lord and is to apply this entire law to her. The husband will be innocent of any wrongdoing, but the woman will bear the consequences of her sin. Now, I want you to understand how God has likened a husband and a wife and an adulterous wife, okay? Adulterous wife is the, are those who have been called to him, but they fornicate with the world and the enemy of God, and they are adulterous. They're not faithful to him. They don't care about truth. It's counterfeit Christianity. That is the adulterous wife. So within that are both males and females. He's just establishing something here so that you can understand what happens to an adulterous wife. Now, let me read you the third trumpet. Revelation 8, verse 10. The third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star, a star as an angel, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on a third, excuse me, and on the springs of water. What's water? Water is multi people's multitudes, languages, and nations. So it's falling on people's multitudes, languages, and nations. The name of the star is Wormwood. Wormwood is a bitter substance. It's a, like a bitter um, herb. A third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. Huh. Where else have we heard about bitter water? We've heard about bitter water with regard to the curse. And what happens during the curse? The abdomen swells. Now let me have you consider this scripture. Jeremiah 30 verse 4. These are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard. Terror, not peace. Ask and see, can a man bear children? Then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Every face turned deathly pale. How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. Why are the men walking around in terror with their hands over their bellies? Every face turned deathly pale. What's going on there? I've also been telling you that Zechariah 5 is another one that God has been putting on me, on me with regard to this third trumpet. I'm going to read that to you as well, and you want to understand the timing. I've been telling you that a house is being built right now for the Antichrist. The, the Antichrist is being set up, and Christian nationalism in the United States is testifying to this Antichrist. They don't realize that they are, but that's what they're setting up. That's what they're campaigning for. Combination of church and state. They want to dominate, and they couldn't possibly know the word if this is what they're doing could not possibly know the word if this is what they're doing. You know, here's what happens when you follow politicians. Hello, politicians have an agenda. You want to follow politicians to tell you how to live a godly life? That's an oxymoron. Bobert, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, these are the people you want to follow? Dressed in the world? Working for the world? People who claim to be Christian with their big crosses? Fox News? You want, you want to follow them? Okay. Zechariah 5, I looked again and there before me was a flying scroll. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, 
I see a flying scroll, 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide. And he said to me, this is the curse that's going out over the whole land. For according to what it says on one side, every thief will be banished. And according to what it says on the other, everyone who swears falsely will be banished. This is happening right now. The Lord Almighty declares, I will send it out and it will enter the house of the thief and the house of anyone who swears falsely by my name. It will remain in that house and destroy it completely, both its timbers and its stones. So anyone who swears falsely by his name is fornicating with the world. They're not in him. They're in someone else. This is the description of an adulterous wife who is experiencing a curse. That curse is going to go into her house. And don't think it's just a woman. I'm speaking figuratively about the female church. This is going to go into the house of everyone who swears falsely by his name. Everyone who is a thief. Now, what does a thief mean? Jesus said that anyone who enters the pen, the sheep pen, any other way but the gate is a thief. He talks about the wedding banquet and someone who's in the wedding banquet and is not dressed in fine linen, bright and clean, right? He is not dressed appropriately for that wedding, is wearing something else, not in clean clothes, which of course, fine linen, white and clean stands for the righteous acts of God's people. That's what God is concerned about us being dressed in. This person is not dressed for that. And they're thrown out. They're identified and they're thrown out. That would also be a thief. Someone trying to enter in some other way, snuck into the wedding feast and, and you know, the, the father is like, uh-uh, not having it. You need to go. How did you get in here, friend? So the Lord Almighty declares, I will send it out and it will enter the house of the thief and the house of anyone who swears falsely by my name. It will remain in that house and it will destroy it completely, both its timbers and its stones. Okay, so that also reminds me of the mold that he established in a house where, you know, the mold is shut up for 10 days and then if it's not healing, like it's not getting better, it's torn down completely, not one stone on another and it's cast outside of the camp. That's what's going on here. God jealously longs for his people and he is not a fool. He is not a fool. He is rightfully jealous over his people because his people are always fornicating with his enemy. Their hearts are always turning away from him. This is the bitter water. A third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. They keep drinking that up, aren't they? They're drinking that defiled, bitter water. It is not living water. It is defiled and it will kill. And you see that, you see the language in there that says a third of the waters turned bitter and the people died from the waters that had become bitter. So it's like these waters, there's some waters that are affecting other waters because waters are people's multitudes, languages, and nations. So people's multitudes, languages, and nations are dying from the other people's multitudes, languages, and nations who are bitter. They keep drinking their water. It's the very reason I tell you, you need to discern who you listen to. You need to discern what you're eating and drinking. In Ezekiel 8, 3, it says, He stretched out what looked like a hand and took me by the hair of my head. The Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven, and in visions of God, he took me to Jerusalem to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court where the idol that provokes to jealousy stood. Now he's going to take Ezekiel on a little tour of the temple. And by the time he gets to the end of that tour, you're going to know what the idol of jealousy is. But what does it say? The idol that provokes to jealousy. There is an idol that incites God's jealous wrath and that begins his great wrath. An idol that provokes to jealousy. And there before me was the glory of God, of the God of Israel, as in the vision I had seen in the plain. Then he said to me, son of man, look toward the north. So I looked and in the entrance of the north of the gate of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here. Things that will drive me far from my sanctuary, but you will see things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance to the court. I looked and I saw a hole in the wall. He said to me, son of man, now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and saw a doorway there. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked and detestable things they're doing there. So I went in and looked and I saw portrayed all over the walls, all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals and all the idols of Israel. In front of them stood 70 elders of Israel and Jazaniah, son of Shaphan, was standing among them. Each had a censer in his hand and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. Okay, so what's incense? Incense is prayers, pr the prayers, right? So a fragrant crowd, cloud of incense was rising. These are prayers, but I don't think they're to God. I don't think they're prayers being lifted up to God. 
He said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own idol? They say the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Again, he said, you will see them doing things that are even more detestable. So he's bringing him through and he's saying, each time you're going to see something even worse, even worse. He's building up until he gets to that idol of jealousy. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north of the gate of the house of the Lord. And I saw women there mourning the God Tammuz. He said to me, do you see this son of man? You will see things that are even more detestable than this. He then brought me in t- into the inner court of the house of the Lord. And there at the entrance to the temple between the portico and the altar were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. They were bowing down to the sun in the east. He said to me, have you seen this son of man? Is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do the detestable things they're doing here? Must they also fill the land with violence and continually arouse my anger? Look at them putting the branch to their nose. Putting the branch to your nose is inciting my wrath. It is a way of saying they provoke me. Therefore, I will deal with them in my anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them. Although they shout in my ears, I will not listen to them. Okay, that's all he shows him in the temple. That was it. You see the women bowing down to the god Tammuz. They're mourning the god Tammuz. And the men are bowing down to the sun. That is what is represented in counterfeit Christianity in that cross. That is the cross to Tammuz. It is the idol that was set up in counterfeit Christianity to represent counterfeit Christianity. And it represents Tammuz and it represents the sun god, which is Tammuz and all of the sun gods served by the Roman Catholic Church. It's the very reason they have that little circle all around the so-called saints and around uh, you know, their, their image of Jesus. They have that little circle. It's like a sun around their head. That is the same sun that goes around the head of Mithras. That's what that is. You thought that represented like the light of Jesus or something? I mean, that's what I used to think. It's, it's a sun god. There's a reason the god of Tammuz is mentioned here. They are worshiping the many gods of Roman Catholicism that pagan Rome has always worshipped. And that image that was set up by Catholicism through Constantine is the cross. It is the idol that provokes to jealousy. Now, so why does the word say that it's going to be set up later? Well, let's take a look at what the word says. Matthew 24, 15. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one go on the, no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. What Jesus is saying is that's that's what incites God's jealous wrath. So already we know that the Antichrist has reigned. The abomination of desolation has been set up in the temple and God is not happy. He is upset. That's what incites his jealous wrath. Now what's going on during that reign? Let's go to Daniel. So just like these trumpets are teasing out those who are returning to God and those who are not, the the reign of the Antichrist is a time of testing, you guys. It is a time in which you've got to put your faith where your mouth is. Now he's built you to a certain point. He's building you to a certain point. By the time that the Antichrist rises, your faith is going to be tested. You are going to have to put your faith where your mouth is. Daniel 9, 27, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of that se- of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering, that is the witnesses. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. That's being built in your heart during that time. So it's either coming out of you, which is the reason I tell you all the time, you need to come out of Babylon and Babylon needs to come out of you. It's either coming out of you or it is set up in you. And that is going to be an incredible time of testing in which the way that you are living is solidifying whose you are. Who do you belong to? What is the image in the heart of those who choose counterfeit Christianity? Well, it's the cross. That's the image. And counterfeit Christianity is going to be coming out of their right arm, their deeds, their forehead, their thoughts their mouth, the way that they speak. What's going to be coming out of you? You can't have any images coming out of you. You can't be holding any images in your heart. All idols have to go. There can't even be one that you're 
that's alongside God, right? All of it needs to be gone. So by this time, the power of God's holy people is being broken and counterfeit Christianity is taking over. And that is what is being set up is that cross, that image. It is a spiritual image. Remember that whatever's coming out in the natural, whatever you can see with your eyes, whether it's physical illness, mental illness, what we're calling mental illness and physical illness, all of these manifestations of your behavior, your deeds, your thoughts, your proclamations, everything in your life is a manifestation of what's in your heart. So I told you on another video that my girlfriend and I were talking last night about throwing out our idols, you know, throwing out our idols and our life becoming something else. You know, I've talked with you about that, throwing everything out. When God started convicting me, it was like, nope, got to go. Not even a question. What is the manifestation of how I'm living? I'm sitting here looking around at my house right now. It's just a house. You know, it's a cozy little house, but there's nothing worldly anymore. I'm not worldly anymore. That is not what is manifesting in my life. I'm not, we were talking about how we used to go shopping just to go shopping and we loved it. And we loved it for like a minute until, you know, the high wore off and then we thought we needed something else. And then we thought we needed something else. What a way to live. Seriously, how disgusting. And she's my sewing buddy. And so, you know, we... We're talking about like our little joggers that we make that are like $3 a yard or something like that. And she was telling me about how she was wearing her joggers for like days on end. And her husband said, are you ever going to take those off? Are you ever going to change those? And she was like, I swear I washed them in between. She cracked me up. But see, these are the things is like, I, we never would have, I, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with shopping at Walmart or TJ Maxx. I, I'm now shopping at Walmart and TJ Maxx for my clothes. I gave away all of my expensive clothes to go and shop at these places, but these were never places I would have shopped before. Some of the things that I'm doing now, and we were talking about like not dyeing our hair, not going to the nail salon. I was spending $400 a month to get my nails done. It's so sickening soaking my nails in acetone so that they could take off the gel manicure and then paying another $500 a month to go get my, you know, detox stuff while I'm soaking my body in acetone. It's like so dumb, so worldly and without understanding. But these are manifestations of what's in your heart. And that's why I say, you know, you look at those people in counterfeit Christianity and you see them dressed in the world they're out. They're out. Immediately in my book, I see them dress like that. No, I don't think so. What about your diamond earrings makes worship more sacred for God? What about your beautiful pressed suit and your sports car and your young wife makes you ready for worship? Nothing. It's the exact opposite. It is the exact opposite. That's how pagans live. And we are not supposed to be dressed in that. You think that's attractive? That's what's in your heart. These things are a manifestation of what's going on in our heart, what's set up in our temple. So that is what is being meant by the curse of bitter water, the abomination that incites God's jealousy, that provokes to jealousy. This is a curse. Trumpet number three is a curse that is going out on all those who are adulterous wives. Now, what have I been telling you that God's doing with those trumpets? He's been calling you in and he's been moving on and moving on quickly. Just as I've told you, I've told you that in other videos, people are being separated. The wheat is being separated from the tares. That's a re the reason why you see a third of the earth, a third of the land, a third of the, you know, that a third of the sea, these things are being pulled out and set in the pile destined for wrath. You need to know that. You need to know that so you stop messing around. Anywhere in your life that you're messing around, it's got to go, guys. So what does Jesus mean when he says, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. What does he mean when you see it? Oh, you're going to see it. Do you see things in the spiritual now? Do you see what's going on? Are you going to see them taking over? Are you beginning to see a stark contrast between those who are in him and those who are not. God jealously longs for you. He jealously longs for his church. He hates it when you turn away from him. You ever been in a relationship with someone who like could kind of take you or leave you? Even if it was for a brief time, right? Like you're giving in this relationship and then you realize like they don't really care about me. Actually, I was talking with someone about that last night who was talking about like, you know, certain friends who like you call them because you haven't heard from them and they don't really call you. 
Like they kind of don't care whether or not they ever talk to you again, kind of seems like. But you're calling them. You're making an effort to have a relationship with them. And the person I was speaking with was telling me, why am I even like putting forth this effort? They were starting to realize, yeah, I don't know if this is really like, why am I doing this? It's not life giving. I'm not giving anything to them and they're not giving anything to me. But it doesn't feel good when you're the one investing in a relationship and the person could take you or leave you. How do you think God feels? He's given us everything. And if you wonder how he feels, read about the adulterous wife. Read about everything that he's given us and how we run away. And we go chase after our lovers at the, you know, prostitute shrines. How we're unlike a regular prostitute because at least they get paid for their services. We just give it away. Read about that in the Bible. This is the curse that's going out right now. And I'm really grateful because God has given me, I don't know if you've noticed this, if you've been listening to the videos, but God's been giving me a piece here and a piece there. And I've been saying, you know, I keep feeling this curse and I keep feeling this, but now he's putting the picture together. Now I get it. Now I get what he's been putting together. I'm still discerning the financial piece. I do feel like there's something financial going on. I don't know if it's part of the third trumpet or, or what that is, but it kind of feels like it is. So I'll, I'll um, you know, I'm just going to leave it where, with what he's revealed. But here's what he's revealing to me now about this curse. It is about being an adulterous wife. So he's getting more specific with his grievance against us. He's getting more specific about who's being set into the pile for destruction. And for this reason, you need to pay attention to the language of the Bible when Paul says, if you hear his voice today, don't be like our ancestors in the wilderness who rejected him, who refused him, and then they died. Because that's what we're risking. If we truly belong to him, we need to live as though we do. We need to repent for the idols that we've placed before him. We need to acknowledge who we've been. We need to be reconciled to our husband. Thank you for listening. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next video.